good afternoon to you all. Thank you for making it to my uh, webinar this afternoon. I'm going to talk, or we're going to have a discussion on the current state of green scientific research on Ghana's Akokowa iron ore. Uh, if you notice, you see that I put green in uh, quotes uh, for a very important reason. For now. now, this is going to be my presentation outline. Uh, I'm going to go through uh, the iron ores in Ghana uh two to recommendations so in addition to the iron ores in ghana i will also limit it down to the newly discovered iron ore deposits in the Uti region we have talked about the akokowa iron ore uh remember that before the akokowa iron ore was uh discovered or reported by the ghana geological survey authority in 2021 uh there was also the Akwafu Tuji iron ore also in the Uti region. So far, we've done a lot of work on that ore already. And as we go through, you will notice that uh, there's not too much difference. Since probably they are in the same uh, region and possibly on the same geological setting. Then we'll talk about work done so far, uh, some results and discussions. Then together we'll answer the question. Uh, GSDEC want to, uh, they have created or they set up the Ghana Integrated Iron and Steel Development Corporation. Now, which way should they go? In other words, which route? Because there are several integrated iron and steel making routes. And usually local conditions will determine which of the routes you need to. So after going through, I think we'll all be ready to answer the question, uh, which route to adopt. Then I'll end with conclusions and then maybe some discuss uh, any recommendations that we have. i will be able to take any questions if available now these are the iron ores in ghana uh, i am sure there may be several of them that are yet to be discovered but for now uh, i'm aware of the upper mansi iron ore in the western region of ghana uh, the shani iron ore i think shani is about 70 kilometers away from yendi in the northern region we have the pudo iron ore in the upper west region of ghana then recently uh, the oti iron ores precisely in Akwafu today Akokowa, Mkwanta, Jamurume, and Wawasu, and so on and so forth. I am aware that there is an iron ore deposit in the Atiwa forest. Uh, you all understand why I will put the question mark there because of the fact that the Atiwa forest is supposed to be a forest reserve region. And maybe in future, uh, we'll have uh, a discussion on whether iron can be mined safely there. Now, this is the iron ore deposits in the Oki region. So if you look at uh, the Ghana map to the extreme, the eastern part, and uh, these are the areas you have, Pantan North, Pantan South, Krachi, Uchimuru, Krachi West, Krachi East, Kajabija, Asikan, and so on and so forth, in that region. And I hope you are aware that this is a region that was created just recently, as part of the six extra regions by uh, government of Ghana. Now, the iron ore deposits, deposits uh, are classified as follows. Uh, this was based on uh, a visit to the website of uh, something created for two region. We have the one, we have the Biakuye, we have the Jasekan, Kajibi, and Krachi East. And if you look at it critically, you see that the apart to the iron ore is in the one region. And then Akokowa, I keep wondering how Akokowa is spelled because Wherever I go, I see it spelled, being spelled differently. I see Akokoa, the catch, catch east. If you look at uh, the fifth, so the sixth row or by series number five, if you look at Crash East, you have a Sukoko, Akokoa, and a Katanga. Now, this is the nature of the Akokoa iron ore. Uh, we got samples recently. As you can see, it looks brownish in color, uh, typical of a very rich. Uh, iron ore. We did some XRF on uh, 10 samples of the cocoa iron ore. I have highlight, highlighted the Fe2O3 in red. So if you look at the first region, the first sample, AKK1, the Fe2O3 content uh, was about 81%. And then I think it was followed by AKK9, that was 76.687. The rest uh, ranged from about 58 
72, about 72, 71.85%. I see that the phosphorus content uh, given by or expressed as P2O5 is low. If you look at it critically, you see that for sample number six and seven, uh, six, seven, and nine, there's virtually no phosphorus being pre uh, phosphorus present. No phosphorus present in sample six, seven, eight, or six, seven, and nine. The rest are just uh, minimal. I think the highest so far being AKK five, which recorded uh, up to about zero point seven two four percent P two O five. Uh, P205 is not a very good thing uh, in ion making, so as much as possible, we try to minimize uh, if it is possible to do so. A uh, typical example is uh, Nigerian or uh, known as the Agbaja ion ore, which is very rich, but currently they, uh, they have issues because of the presence of high levels of P205. The uh, problem with P2O5 is that uh, the phosphorus uh, pentaoxide, uh, in the course of reducing your ion, uh, the phosphorus is also subjected to reduction in the same way as the ion is reduced. That will result in the uh, production of phosphorus. Now, this phosphorus cannot be removed usually, so it will end up in the final product, and that is not good enough for steel making. Another thing that we need to know is the SO3. That is a sulfide content uh, expressed here as SO3, sulfur uh, trioxide. Uh, fortunately, just like the, the phosphorus, the sulfur content is also on the lower side, which is good for the Akopua iron ore. So if you look at the fact that the iron ore ranges from about 58 up to about 81 uh, percent hematite, Coupled with the fact that there is a very low content of phosphorus and then low content of uh, sulfur, then the cocoa ion ore is a good candidate for Agane's intended uh, integrated ion and cell development uh, process. I see alumina and I also see silica. The alumina content is a bit on the lower side, especially if you compare. Uh, the aquacoa ion ore to the uh, opomancy ion ore. The silica content, however, is a bit on the higher side. Uh, not all of them, some of them are a bit low, but there's a way to deal with the silica. So, uh, on the whole, you take a look at it and you see that uh, it is a very good ore, and we should be grateful that we have been able to discover this ion ore. This is the XRD of the aquacoa ion ore. Uh, if you take a look at the XRD, you notice that it is a mixture of silica and hematite, as was observed uh, in the XRF. Now, a distinct difference over here between the cocoa ion ore and that of the opomancy ion ore is that the cocoa ion ore appears to be a hematite ore with large amounts of silica. In this way, it differs from the opomancy ore which combines are uh, usually hematite and gatite with large amounts of alumina. We are currently working on how to uh, find ways and means of uh, tackling uh, an iron ore with a high silica content as well as an iron ore with a high alumina content. Uh, the two uh, impurities, your alumina and then silica, usually can lead to the generation of large amount of slag which is not good for the process because it tends to result in consumption of large amount of energy. As you know, a slug, molten slug will have lower conductivity as opposed to the molten metal. So as much as possible, we always take steps to minimize the silica content as well as the alumina content. This is the XRD of the poor mancy ion for comparison. If you compare this to the previous one, you notice that for the opomancy ion ore, uh, we have large amounts of Fe2O3 combined with uh, aluminum hydroxide, uh, usually in the form of gypsite. So you compare this to the previous one, then you see that uh, they both have hematite. Uh, difference, major difference being that the aquacoa ion ore appears to have large amounts of silica as opposed to the 
upon my say iron ore and that has large amounts of alumina. Now at this stage, uh, having had a view about the nature of the Akokowa iron ore, then we must be thinking of which way to go. How are we going to uh, take advantage of the existence of this ore for Ghana's integrated iron and steel development cooperation for job creation and industrialization? Uh, as you may be aware, in the conventional way of producing metallic iron and steel, uh, you need large reserves of coal, uh, typically uh, cooking coals, so that you can turn the coal to metallurgical coal, uh, which can then be used to produce your iron via the blast in its wood. That's the conventional way. Uh, but in addition to the conventional way, we have alternative iron making processes. And for this reason, uh, a lot of research is ongoing, uh, depending on local conditions, so that you can come up with a method that is well suited to your environment. This, we think, uh, is important, especially if you want to cut down on the need to spend too much uh, converting your dollar, uh, your CDs into dollars, and then uh, so we need to save foreign exchange, which is why we need to find a way of producing our metallic iron and our steel making uh, using available conditions. It was based on this that uh, years ago, we embarked on this uh, process of uh, polymer reduction technology. I uh, have already taken you through before, but I think it will not be a bad idea if I quickly summarize. Now, in the conventional way of producing iron, uh, it's mentioned, or it was mentioned that iron oxide combines with carbon to produce metallic iron and then carbon dioxide. Now, if you look at this critically, you notice that the reaction actually consists of the hematite combining with carbon to form iron and then carbon monoxide. Remember, the carbon monoxide that is produced is also a very powerful reducing agent. So accordingly, as it is formed, it will partake in the reduction process with the hematite to form your metallic ion in carbon dioxide. Now, if you couple this with the Woodward reaction, then you will be able to notice that uh, in the conventional way of producing uh, metallic ion using metallurgical coke, your major, uh, your major gas, gases that are evolved into the atmosphere are predominantly carbon monoxide and then carbon dioxide. That's a conventional way. And at a time that the world is trying to move away from, uh, or the world is trying to uh, decrease its carbon footprint, uh, there's a need to find other technologies that can minimize the production of carbon dioxide, if not eradicate, eradicating it completely. Now, if you compare the conventional way to the use of polymer, as a reductant in our polymer reduction technology. We can replace our metallurgical coke with a polymer. Uh, reason being that uh, in metallurgical coke, the major component is carbon. And it is a carbon that picks out the, picks the oxygen from the metal oxide to form the metal and then your carbon monoxide plus your carbon dioxide. Now, any polymer that contains your carbon and hydrogen uh, like all the polymers that we have in Ghana, your waste plastics, your uh, biomass materials, your sawdust, and so on and so forth. They contain large amounts of carbon and large amounts of hydrogen. Now, both carbon and hydrogen are powerful reducing agents. And the good thing about our polymers is that uh, at higher temperatures, they are able to undergo thermal decomposition uh, sometimes combined with some oxygen, if the environment is oxidation in, uh, uh, oxidizing enough, to generate powerful reducing agents, uh, that of hydrogen, methane, carbon monoxide, and so on and so forth. These are all powerful reducing agents that can come out from the polymer for the uh, purpose of serving as a reducing agent. So when you use your polymer as a reductor, the major reaction is that of iron oxide 
uh, reacting with the polymer to form metallic ion. And then instead of producing carbon dioxide, we produce what is known as singers. We produce what is known as singers. Uh, this is because uh, in the polymer, which consists of both your carbon and your hydrogen atoms, the carbon is a reducing agent, the hydrogen is a reducing agent as well. Now, when carbon uh, reacts with iron oxide, it produces carbon dioxide. And when hydrogen reacts with iron oxide, uh, it produces water in the form of a uh, water vapor. Because of the presence of large amounts of carbon, uh, your carbon dioxide along with your water vapor may further react with the uh, excess carbon in the system to generate your CO and then your H2. And when you put your CO and your H2 uh, together, we produce what is known as singers. If you have some electrical engineers over here, you will notice that singers is a very important uh, gas that can be used to drive turbines to generate electricity that can be fed back into the national grid. Again, singers, uh, if you are a chemical based engineer, you will notice that singers uh, is also uh, a very useful feedstock for the production of uh, methanol. You can combine carbon monoxide and hydrogen under the uh, influence or under the presence of uh, industrial catalyst to produce methanol. So this is one unique advantage when you use your polymer in place of your metallurgical group or in addition or in a blend, in blends with metallurgical group uh, to produce your metal and then uh, you cut down significantly on the gases uh, that are produced as uh, typically carbon dioxide. So you compare it to obviously in, from the environmental point of view, you notice that uh, the use of polymer has certain unique advantages over the conventional way of producing uh, your metal and your steel. Now, having gathered this information, I uh, wish to take you through some work done so far. Uh, as well as the Akokowa ion ore is concerned, and then also uh, some snippets from other works that have been done on other ion making processes. I'm happy to announce that um, this process has been trialed on other ion ores from the sub region. We have tried it on the Marampa ion ore from Cameroon. Uh, from uh, Sierra Leone. We've tried it on the Mbalam iron ore from Cameroon. Uh, we've also tried it on Mount Tukade iron ore from from Liberia. We are currently working on the Gangra iron ore from Liberia. Uh, we've tried it on several iron ores from Nigeria, uh, the Agbaja iron ore, the Itape Koji iron ore, and so on and so forth. And so far, results have been very promising. So let's move on. Now, these are some of the carbonaceous materials that we have used so far. Uh, I think we have used uh, passenger ties, so vehicle ties. Now, you may be wondering why we are using, we, you can use vehicle ties in this way. If I take any tie, whether it is passenger or a heavy duty truck tie, uh, your tie can contain anything from about 80 to about 86% in the raw state carbon. 80 to 86% carbon in the raw state. In addition, it has hydrogen. And as you know, both carbon and hydrogen are reducing agents. So the vehicle ties, the billions of vehicle ties that are held in various stockpiles are actually very good uh, feedstock for iron and steel making technologies. Uh, go to the mining industries. Uh, we have our mining gurus over here. Uh, your track ties, your heavy duty track ties. If you are struggling to uh, dispose of it, know that it is a useful material for metal reduction processes. Now, so on the work with vehicle ties, uh, we did some charring, but when you do 
the chairman, uh, you notice that for vital ties, even though the elemental carbon composition uh, is anything from about 80 to 86 percent, when you char it in the open, uh, you are able to get around 32 percent carbon. You're able to get around 32 percent carbon. Uh, the rest is unaccounted for. So we adopted a system uh, to account for why, uh, the, uh, to account for the, um, or to make use of um, the other components that were escaped into the environment when you do open charring. Now, the averagely, uh, open charring will produce just about uh, 32% carbon, which is because of the fixed carbon content of the vehicle type. So we, instead of uh, charring in the open, we decided to uh, go through the pyrolysis route. We did our pyrolysis and all the gases that would otherwise have ended up in the atmosphere, we were able to condense the gases into liquid fuel, uh, that of a desired range liquid fuel, as you can see on the top left corner. Now, after collecting our liquid fuel, the, the solid waste that was left in the uh, reactor, the char, we picked it and then we were able to characterize the tie to see what was there, the char that was there. You can see an SEM EDS uh, below. I've marked a certain region over there, and uh, this is typical of all the regions that you can see in the SEM EDS. In the SEM EDS, we found out that carbon content by mass was about 88.13%. It meant that we could significantly reduce the gases that would otherwise have been generated into the atmosphere by converting the gases to liquid fuel and then taking the char and using it as a reducing agent, as it contains very high amounts of carbon. If I, in a worst, it, uh, it goes up to about 86%, but when you char, you see that uh, it could go up to about 88%, if not more. Now, we, in this process, in addition to the vehicle ties, uh, we use all forms of uh, polymers. We have pure water sachet, PWS, with other uh, containers, uh, other containers, plastic containers from uh, body lotion containers and so on and so forth. They, are all, they all contain carbon. Now, when we pulverize the pure water sachet along with the other, uh, the other containers containing carbon, that is what we get. Pulverized P uh, PWS, pure water sachet. This is very high in carbon and hydrogen content. This is, these are typical examples of PP. If you go to the lower bottom side, uh, PP buckets, uh, your trash cans, when you use them and then they get to the point where you have to discard them, what happens to them? Uh, we subjected this to this, uh, through the same process and then that was what we got uh, from the pulverization process. These are very rich carbon sources that can easily be mixed with pulverized iron or uh, you form pellets and then you are ready to produce your metallic iron. This is PET. I think we all, once in a while, we have to buy water, whether it is bell aqua, uh, whether it's, um, you can leave them a week. Uh, so many types of uh, 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 water bottles. The water bottles, are uh, actually produced from a uh, polyethylene terephthalate. So they are typically PET bottles. When you pulverize them, uh, that is what you put in over there to the top right. Now, PET unfortunately has a little bit of uh, lower carbon as, as compared to the other uh, polymers. Most of the polymers will have carbon in excess of 80%. Uh, PET, however, has uh, carbon around 62.5%. And then about a third of each week uh, consists of oxygen. Uh, the oxygen, the presence of the oxygen is uh, both good and bad. 
it is good because uh, when you subject to the thermal decomposition, you can produce uh, carbon monoxide. That is a powerful reducing agent. It is bad because uh, the presence of the oxygen can combine with the carbon to generate large amount of carbon dioxide uh, during the reduction process. As you move on, you will notice the gas reduction studies. And then you notice that uh, for PET, if you lose this large amount of heat, even though you're able to achieve your reduction uh, quite well, uh, the drawback is that of uh, the generation of high amount of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. If you have been to shopping, and then typically when you go there, we are giving shopping bags. We are giving shopping bags. Uh, you go to Melcom and then name them. Now these shopping bags are made of low density polyethylene. Low density polyethylene. Uh, the composition over here is not very different from that of uh, high density polyethylene. If you have taken uh, sachet water, your sachet is actually, in most cases, it is made of a uh, high density polyethylene. And that, along with LDPE, will contain carbon in excess of 85% and about 14% hydrogen. So if I take sachet, if I take my shopping bags, it's actually a mixer of carbon and hydrogen and nothing else. Sometimes you may have some impurities. When you subject it to charring, that is what we obtain on the bottom right, as you can see in the slide. Then our packaging, our packaging, polystyrene. Uh, on the day that a party is organized or a funeral is organized, when they share food, uh, you see large amounts of uh, these takeaway containers. Uh, if you buy a fridge, you buy a TV from Malcolm or whatever, uh, typically they will be packaged using this uh, white uh, polymer. That is polystyrene. That is polystyrene. Uh, polystyrene contains so far about the highest carbon of about 92%. About 92%. And then uh, approximately 8% hydrogen. So just like the, uh, the sachet and then the shopping bags, if I take poly uh, polystyrene, it is something that is actually made of, of only carbon and hydrogen. And that is ready for use as a reducing agent in iron and steel making technologies. Uh, go to any mechanic shop, uh, go to the gas stations, uh, the filling stations. What do you notice? You go and then you change your dirty oil, you want to change the oil in your car. So you buy uh, oil, new, uh, fresh oil, and then your, after using it, what happens to the containers? Uh, these containers are typically made of high density polyethylene. And like I said, the carbon content alone is in excess of 85%, the hydrogen content around 14%. So these are all very good sources of carbon that can be used in a potential iron and cell making uh, process in Ghana. And they are available free of charge. Now, in trying to generate in trying to generate our carbonaceous materials, there are several things, ways that you can go. One of the ways that you can use, where you can uh, crush and grind your plastics, is the use of what we call the cutting mill pulverizers. Uh, if you look at the extreme uh, left uh, with A, where I have my feeder, you can feed it in, you crash, you pulverize, there's a collecting bucket over there, and then we have some sieves. So these sieves will decide on the level of pulverization that you want to achieve. This was something that I saw in Australia years ago that I used for generating uh, pulverized uh, carbonaceous material. Now we come to Ghana, uh, obviously we don't have this. Of course, uh, recently we purchased one that could uh, crush plastics, grind plastics as well, but that one could not uh, stand uh, plastics like sachet and then like since they appear to be too dark for the crushing. Accordingly, uh, we at Yuma decided to adopt a different process uh, to be able to achieve the same purpose. We have adopted, or we came along with a process where we do a heating and quenching uh, process. So you take your plastics, 
you heat it up to a certain temperature uh, for them to become molten, and then you quench. When you quenching, the essence of the quenching is to render the plastics uh, brittle. So it is a heating and an embrittlement process. You heat and then you quench to render them brittle. And then once they become brittle, you can use any uh, means to pulverize them, even including uh, a laboratory uh, ball mill, just place them there and then you are able to pulverize to achieve the fine powders that you saw. Now, so we get our powders, uh, so pulverized carbonaceous material, whether you char, uh, whether you do a heating and brittlement process, whether you do uh, Sometimes you can also dissolve or maybe immerse these plastics in liquid nitrogen. And I hope that this is a cryogenic process of generating your, uh, your pulverized materials by just immersing your plastics in liquid nitrogen and then they become instantly uh, brittle and then you can also break them. Now, once you have your powder, regardless of the wood that you pick, with your powder or your pulverized carbonaceous material, you can mix your pulverized carbonaceous material with your pulverized iron ore, you form pellets, and then you are ready to do reduction to produce your metallic iron. Now, these are typical examples. Uh, that is a cylindrical pellet. This is uh, a pseudo spherical pellet, a cylindrical pellet. These are all iron ores. The red ones are iron ores. Uh, the black one that you see here was actually iron ore from a slug, an electric in a slug. They all contain large amounts of carbon for the work to begin. Now, to see whether the iron that you produce will work in industry. In other words, if you needed to scale up, uh, moving from the confines of the lab and then you move to uh, the real situations. The horizontal tube furnace was something that was created to mimic whatever happens, whether in a steel making process or in an iron making process. That is the sketch, uh, a photo of the horizontal tube furnace. So, uh, once we form pellets, the pellets are ready to be reduced in this horizontal tube furnace. As you can see, we have a gas outlet there said that when the reaction takes place, an argon gas uh, acting as a carrier gas is flushed through the whole system and this carrier gas is able to flush all the carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, methane, hydrogen gas, water vapor that is produced as a result of the production reaction. And these are allowed through uh, an exhaust pipe over there and this exhaust is connected to a gas analyzer. So based on this, you are able to follow the progress of your reaction. Schematically, this is how the horizontal tube finish looks like. So what you saw, that is the scheme over there. Uh, your, there's a hot zone over here where reaction actually takes place. We have a cold zone. There is an alumina tube. Uh, this is connected to a CCD camera and a DVD system to uh, video everything. So you're able to capture everything in situ uh, that happens uh, during the process of reduction. That is the argon gas tank, which is flushed through, and then by means of flushing the argon gas through continuously, is able to carry all the carbon monoxide and all the carbon dioxide and all the gases that are produced uh, to the IR gas analyzer or a DC analyzer, depending on what you want. And by means of measuring the gases produced every 10 seconds, you are able to uh, come along with data for calculating the extent of reduction along with the rate of reduction and other things. Now, after the reaction, this is how the hot reaction zone looks like. If you look through it, uh, you see that temperatures could go up to about 1,600 degrees Celsius in the horizontal tube furnace. Now, we also decided to do what is known as open reduction. Now, unlike the Reaction in the horizontal tube finish where you have argon flushing all the carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide to yield high levels of metallic ion uh, because the carbon dioxide that is produced is picked or carried away by the argon gas. 
so that in accordance with Louis Chatelier's principle, uh, as you remove more of the gases, the reaction will react further to generate more of the gases as they are being removed. This is a very good thing for the process, and usually this is an ideal condition. Uh, we did such reactions in the horizontal two phenomena, but we also wanted to see that in the real sense it also works. So we try to generate something, a very simple uh, reactor uh, or heating source from vehicle ties. Uh, these are the reaction crucibles in there. We blow gas through it constantly to make sure that we get the right temperature for the reduction process. Now, after doing that, we are able to see whether we can get some metals produced under these hard conditions. Because this is a highly oxidizing environment because of the presence of oxygen. And if you're able to reduce and produce your metal in this way, it means that you are ready uh, to carry out this process in industry. We also tried, uh, because sometimes it's either you're producing iron filings or you're producing iron nuggets. In the horizontal two furnace, you produce iron nuggets. Uh, when you heat in the open, uh, sometimes the iron that you produce is in the form of iron filings. Regardless of whether they are nuggets or filings, the iron content will go as high as 97, 90, 99% iron. Uh, so we also try, because these days, uh, the new approach is to use microwaves for meteorological processes. To ensure that this process uh, will also be suited to reduction the microwave, we went for a domestic microwave, and then we try out the same thing over here. So that is a fire clay crucible containing your pellets in your domestic microwave. You just switch it on for about 30 minutes and reduction will proceed. After which uh, you can switch it off, bring your container out, your metal is produced. Now, when you bring the crucible uh, from the uh, domestic microwave, this is what you see. The iron oxide combined with the carbonaceous material are powerful microwave absorbers. So the moment you form your pellets, your pellets consist of a, an intimate mixture of your hematite with carbonaceous material. So what is happening is that the reduction distances are decreased since you form pellets, uh, both in the pulverized state. So you reduce reduction distances and then you're able to get create what is what are known as a micro reactors. So immediately you put them in the microwave, reaction proceeds uh, almost immediately and you are able to uh, get your metal being produced. So that is when you bring your uh, fire clay crucible from the domestic microwave. Now, some results and discussion from the work that we have done so far on the Akokowa iron ore. This is the nature of uh, reduced metal produced after the reduction process. As you can see, uh, it consists of several mixtures of large uh, spherical block, uh, droplets of metallic ion, along with uh, several millions of ion particles mixed with excess carbonaceous material. Now, once you form them in this way, you can easily pick your metal by using any screwed, uh, magnetic screwdriver or any magnet. It will just pick them and they remove your metallic ion from uh, the carbonaceous material that is. Uh, produced as a result of the reduction. Now, this is after we had removed our metal and then we wash it with some acetone, dry, and then this is the metal that we produce. Now, as you can see, this is a premium grade iron nugget. I'm sure you may be wondering why we have some of them appear to form CS because they were formed in the molten state and then in an attempt to, when you bring them out and then uh, they begin to solidify, because they were formed in the molten state to minimize surface energy, uh, the metals will assume the shape of a sphere. So if you look at them critically, you see that uh, all of them attempt to form a spherical shape because uh, they were formed in the molten state. Now, this is a high grade, a premium grade, metallic iron. And if I show you the XLD later on, uh, you notice that uh, iron content could go up to about 99%. So 
sometimes uh, anything from about 90 to about 99 percent the rest will be carbon uh depending on the carbonaceous material that you use you may have carbon and sometimes some amount of sulfur but it is a premium grade because it is a high quantity uh contains large amounts of carbon so you put everything together these are samples of metallic ion that we produce uh, from our polymer reduction technology now why do i say it's a premium grade now take a look at the xrd what do you notice uh from an initial ion oxide that we showed for the apocryphal ion ore as well as the common say ion ore we have disappearance of peaks uh peaks of silica alumina and other uh, contaminants they all disappear and then in their place you have peaks of metallic ion appearing when you use copper as a source of x-rays metallic ion will form uh, at peaks around 45 65 and 82 for two theta degree so this is telling you that the ion that is produced uh, is purely metallic ion and nothing else you may have some carbon sometimes but uh, clearly it shows that uh, you have a uh, large amount of iron over here the peaks are very distinct uh, and they stand out from the rest of the amorphous regions now so to the big question in the conventional way of producing uh, steel now i'm sure uh, once in a while you see some guys holding some trucks they move around they pick some scrap they go out, move around pick some scrap and sometimes if you have your fridge outside if you're not careful they will add it to the scrap now the conventional way of electric arc finish steel making is to just to go for scrap you melt your scrap uh you do what is nice slack for me by passing carbon through and then you produce your steel so you can actually produce your steel by avoiding the iron making step okay you produce your steel by avoiding the iron making step if you have enough quantities of scrap but this is where uh, you typically you have an issue fact is high grade scrap or high quality scrap is now becoming a, a scarce commodity owing to stiff competition from countries in southeast asia people are moving away owing to the flexibility of electric arc finish steel making uh, most steel makers are moving away from uh, the conventional blast finish basic oxygen finish steel making to electric arc finish steel making if, if i go to north america uh, it's predominantly electric arc finish steel making but that is subject to availability of high grade scrap now, because of competition from Southeast Asian countries, uh, it gets to a point where you have to struggle for scrap. In fact, in Ghana, in the year 2011 and then 2010-2011, uh, uh, steel, steel makers in Tema uh, gave an ultimatum to the government of Ghana then that they were not getting enough scrap, uh, scrap because uh, the scrap people were just exporting everything. Of course. They also wanted to make profit so for this reason i think uh it is important that steel makers will have to sit down and then think of finding ways and means of uh or finding fitting substitutes for this crap now we can use uh what we produce our premium grade iron nuggets can be used as partial replacement of the scrap now the good thing about this is that if you look at the scrap look at where the scrap is stockpiled uh, typically it will come along with a lot of uh, impurities dust uh, grease and so on and so forth so the chemistry of the scrap as far as steel making is concerned is a bit problematic because you cannot control what is in there and you have no idea the the content of iron in the scrap because they come from um, miscellaneous and um, different sources you pick them from various sources you put them together and then you are ready to use them for semi now the good thing about uh producing your own 
iron nuggets, and then blending them with the scrap is that they help to dilute impurities from your scrap. Okay? And because the iron that you're able to produce, we know the content. So that will provide us with a better steel chemistry, improve, and then improve slag formability. In fact, in electrical furnace steel making, it is all about your ability to get a very uh, a well defined slag forming process uh, for at least five minutes. And then you're able to cut down on large amounts of energy consumption. So we are in a stage where uh, we have our steel makers in Ghana. I am sure most of them will be, uh, or it will be predominantly electrical furnace steel making. If you struggle for scrap, then it is. We are now at a stage where we have to think of finding fitting replacements for the scrap. And that is why we have to make use of our iron ore reserves in Ghana. Now, let me compare. Uh, you may be wondering, but how efficient this process, how efficient is this process? Let me compare uh, this process to the conventional wood where metallurgical coke is used. I have, in this graph, I plotted the graph of fraction reduced, uh, which is a function of uh, the extent of reduction uh, as a function of time. In the first five minutes of reduction, using various carbonaceous material, and I have compared that one with the conventional route where we use metallurgical coke. Now, on the horizontal axis, uh, if you look at the line, uh, the horizontal axis passing through the line one. So the fractional reduce, uh, fraction reducing ranges from zero, 0 0.2 up to one. Now, wherever your line will cut uh, the one, the line horizontal line passing through one, that is when your reduction is complete. Under identical conditions, I have uh, the white graph. I have my pure water sachet. I have my low density polyethylene from shopping bags. The pure water sachet. I have polypropylene from discarded buckets, uh, trash cans, and so on and so forth. Then I have my metallurgical coke, which is the conventional material used in iron making, steel making. I have my PET, your voltaic water bottles, and then I have my mixed plastic waste. Mixed plastic waste. Now, this mixed plastic waste, the idea is that it is difficult, labor intensive, and all hygienic to sort out plastics. So typically, if you go to any uh, municipal solid waste stream, plastics are combined. Uh, to attempt to sort them out could be problematic. So we decided to use uh, the plastics in a mixed state as also a reducing agent. Now, if you look at the graph critically, you will notice that the best performance was from the mixed plastic waste. In that within two minutes, I can have my iron oxide be reduced get my metal and ready to be used, especially in the horizontal to finish. Now, environmental friendliness. How environmental friendly is your process? Now, this depends. So here I have plotted a graph of concentration of carbon dioxide as a function of time in the first 10 minutes of reduction. The industrially, the, the conventional route is what is the graph in red, okay? And you have the other polymers there. If you look at the graph critically, uh, it is obvious that the worst performer is from PET, polyethylene terephthalate, uh, your voltage bottles and the like. And there is a reason to that. I mentioned early on that when you use PET, so if you look at the graphs, the worst performer, as far as the environment is concerned, is that of PET, polyethylene terephthalate. Uh, there is a reason. If I take polyethylene terephthalate, I mentioned that it contains the least amount of carbon, but a large amount, about a third of its weight, is oxygen. For this reason, the oxygen in the PET will always attempt to combine with the carbon to form carbon monoxide and then carbon dioxide. In fact, we did some uh, we did some carbon uh, gas measurements. Uh, just heating PET wall, and then you saw that a large amount of carbon dioxide is involved when you hit the PET wall using a gas chromatographic analysis. Now, the next performer, uh, if you take the PET, you also see that uh, outside of the PET, 
your conventional wood metallurgical coke uh, also has large amount of carbon that was had been evolved and not surprisingly uh, your mixed plastic waste remember your mixed plastic waste when you are mixing them pet was also there so certainly uh the pet when you combine them the pet already is coming along with its oxygen and carbon and then so, so it will have an effect on the gas emissions but take a look at your pure water sachet your ldpe and then your pp what do you notice you see that the carbon dioxide that are emitted are background carbon dioxide very low in 2011 we did some gas measurements and compared with uh metallurgical cook uh, in the conventional way we saw that uh when you replace part of the metallurgical cook with uh polymers like pure water sachet uh, low density polyethylene polypropylene polystyrene and polystyrene you are able to cut down uh, carbon emissions by as much as 75 percent this work was repeated by Carpenter uh, and Co. in the UK. And they came along with just about the same finding. So, in a nutshell, uh, from the point of view of environment, if you can control the levels of the uh, Vortic plus, uh, what is it, the water bottles in the, the plastics in the municipal solid waste, you can bring down the carbon dioxide that is emitted into the atmosphere significantly. I also uh, measured the accumulated amount in moles, the amounts as a function of time. And it's obvious that a PET is not doing very well from the point of view of the environment, followed by the MPW because the MPW also contains your PET. And then, so you see that the metallurgical coke is only better, not in terms of uh, efficiency or productivity, but in terms of gas emissions. But the rest of the plastic, your pure water sachet, that is HDP, LDP, PP, PS, and coal, they all fall significantly below the conventional way of producing metallic ion in industry. So now we are in a position to answer this question. Uh, GSDEC was set up in 2019. I think we have uh, the deputy uh, CEO over here. Maybe you can correct me. But I know GSDEC, I read about GSDEC somewhere in 2019. The Ghana Integrated Iron and Steel Development Corporation. Now, where do we move? Which route? I am going to take you through, in the next few slides, the various routes that we have as far as iron and steel and integrated iron and steel making development cooperation is concerned. And then from there, we will be able to be in a position to answer the route that we need to go. Now, these are the routes. Uh, the first one is your blast furnace iron making. Uh, and then you combine it with basic oxygen furnace steel making. Now, let me say at this juncture that in terms of iron making processes, the blast furnace alone accounts for over 90%. So in fact, conventionally, iron making is predominantly the blast this iron making process. So you go to countries like China, where they have a lot of metallurgical coal, it's predominantly the blast finish, basic oxygen finish, steel making wood. But for countries like Ghana, uh, one major disadvantage of the blast finish is that it relies heavily on high-grade metallurgical coal. And to produce metallurgical coal, it means that you have to have large reserves of uh, cooking coal. Now, the production of metallurgical coke from cooking coal alone is problematic from the point of view of the environment. And you need uh, several billions of dollars to be able to set up a typical blast furnace. So for poor countries like Ghana, we may want to avoid the blast furnace. And I hope nobody is offended that I'm saying that uh, Ghana is poor. We are very poor. Uh, to go by the blast furnace route, uh, we're going to be in trouble because you need some two billion or more to set up a typical blast furnace. Now the next thing will be smelting reduction ion making coupled with basic oxygen finish cell making. Uh, remember that uh, the blast finish route will send molten 
meta moving ion to the still making step so if you have smelting reduction you can also couple it with the basic oxygen finish step you can also couple your smelting reduction ion making with the electric actualist still making in this case uh you may have to find a way to let the molten metal that you produce uh, cool down but that is also going to result in loss of energy you cool down and then you send the metal to the electric actualist of course innovations are being made currently as we speak uh in both the basic oxygen finish and then the electric output finish route then we move to direct reduction ion making what you call the dri you combine your dri with electric arc finish still making that is a route and your direct reduction ion making is one of the alternative ion making processes away from the blast finish ion making process then we have direct reduction ion making combined with basic oxygen finish ion making remember in the uh, basic oxygen finish making uh, it uses both molten metal and then some amount of scrap typically you may have a uh, scrap of about up to about 20 percent of the weight of the metal uh, content and then about 80 percent uh, molten metal from the blastness is then poured onto the scrap to do your seal making so the basic oxygen finish is able to uh, accommodate some amount of scrap and therefore it can also accommodate any metal that we produce from any of the alternative making uh, ion making routes but it is uh, a predominantly molten metal uh, process even though it's now configured to accept some levels of uh, solid metals then we have the conventional scrap to electric arc finish still making uh, this is, I'm sure, what is being practiced in Ghana. So you have your scrap, get your guys to gather your scrap, then send your scrap to your, your EAF, you melt your EAF, you pass your carbon and oxygen through simultaneously to cause some slack for me, and then you produce your steel. This is the simplest and the most flexible approach. But like I mentioned, uh, you cannot rely on scrap alone uh, for an efficient electric arc finish still making process we need to make use of our iron values in the country to create job and also for the sake of industrialization now uh, this have all these we have put them together in the available rules uh, in accordance with uh, carpenter and co so as you can see, the blast finish route is at the top, where you have your coal. Uh, you have to convert your coal to coke oven. Uh, look at the carbon dioxide that you give off. And then you get finally to produce your liquid steel, and then you do casting rolling uh, to the specification of your clients. You can start with the smelting reduction. Uh, at smelting reduction, you should have the blast finish will only join the basic oxygen uh, finished wood. But the other still uh, iron making processes are flexible. If I take the smelting reduction process, I can link it with the basic oxygen finish or with the electric arc finish. And I have my direct reduction process. Now for the DRI, I can link my DRI to the basic oxygen finish because I mentioned that the BOF can accept solid materials as well. So scrap, a bit of scrap, about 20%. Or any metal that you produce from a DRI. And then I can link my DRI with the electric arc finish to also produce my liquid steel. And finally, the simplest route I have my scrap, just send my scrap to EAF, produce my liquid steel, and then I do my casting uh, rolling to produce my steel today. Specification of my clients. Now, so now let's get back to uh, the Ghanaian situation, uh, the local condition. What are the local conditions? Uh, we went through the XRF of the Akokoa iron ore. In fact, we've done the XRF for all the iron ores in Ghana. Uh, if you were to compare this to the iron ores from countries like Guinea, you notice that Ghana's iron ores are of low quality as opposed to that from Guinea. 
So at best, we can say that Ghana's iron ores are low to medium grade. Okay. Now, for this reason, now if I move to the Oki region, uh, for example, at the Akofutuji, Akofutuji is a town that is sitting on the iron ore reserve. The conditions are such that um, if I want to set up a blastness, it will be a problem. To be a problem. So the location as well as the low grade, the otherwise low grade of our iron ore will be such that the conditions will favor an iron making route through the uh, rotary half finish route. And by the rotary half finish, rotary half finish is one of the alternative iron making processes uh, that will uh, produce iron by something similar to the DRI process, the direct reduced iron process. Now, for, for this reason, it is suggested that for the integrated approach, a rotary hard furnace uh, stroke and metric arc furnace route can be taken advantage of to come along with a locally available, uh, to combine it with uh, locally available resources. And as you saw from the gas emissions, so that we can also clean up the environment. Uh, we clean up the environment by the less amount of carbon dioxide being generated, along with getting rid of all the carbonaceous materials, your sachet, your PET, every carbon. Globally, the, uh, globally we are struggling to recycle uh, plastics. So in, as a step towards cleaning the environment, coupled with the fact that uh, when you use uh, the polymers, carbon dioxide that is produced can be reduced by as much as 75%. It is suggested that we go by the RHF EAF route. Now in conclusion, Ghana's Akokowa iron ore is a low to medium grade iron ore. Now we have demonstrated that uh, we can produce iron by avoiding coke. So we saying that Free iron and steel making is possible in Ghana. Now, having gone through the conditions, we realize that uh, the, our conditions favor iron making by the RHF route. In other words, we couple the RHF with the electric arc furnace route. So, for an integrated approach, we suggest that RHF EAF route uh, must be adopted to make maximum use of locally available resources as well as clean up the environment. I want to thank you all at this stage and then to thank you very much.